Hey, hi. Hi, everyone. So welcome to Assembly 2020, a special online edition of Somerset House Studios annual experimental music series. It's running from, um, I mean, it was running from the 23 up until tomorrow, 27. I am Christelle Oyeri, I'm an artist, musician, DJ and writer. Yeah. Uh, huh? I'm saying yeah. <laughs> <That's your. laughs> I sometimes go by the name of Christelle Mess. Today I will be talking to musician La Fonda ahead of the presentation of her new audio work for Assembly 2020. It's the result of a four month residency at Somerset House Studios, support, supported by Gerhood Hearts Development Program Fund as part of Scenic Terrain. How to introduce my dear La Fonda? She's a visionary composer and singer who has just released her second album, The Fifth Season, on Parisian la label Latency. And it's, we can say that it's pretty different from your first album, which was like more produced. I believe it was made in a much longer time span mm -hmm. than the fifth season, mm -hmm. which I didn't even notice you <laughs> making it. So it's like um, the album, I think, are different through their process of making, but also like their sound are very different. Like the F Ancestor Boy was more like digi digital, like maybe less analog than the fifth season, I believe, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is a little, is more analog than Ancestor Boy. Mm -hmm. So, we can say that you're like in a different in a different kind of volatility and you invited a spontaneity into the process of making an album. You collaborated with Tion Cross from Sons of Kemet, trombonist Nathaniel Cross, percussionist Valentina Mag Magalete, Magaliti, mm -hmm. Nick Waze on the keys, additional production and French rapper Lala Ace and visual artist Marguerite Umo. Following our chat, La Fonda's Antinomie Sounds Peace will be presented online this evening at 7 p.m. London time, so it's in one hour. It will be available in, on a new interactive listening platform made especially for the series. So to actually listen to the piece, you need to go to assembly2020.co. So if you have any question, please just comment and send your question. We will be able to respond to them. So first and foremost, the piece is starts with a dialogue between stones. And I was intrigued because you manage to make stones the most living thing, <laughs> the, the most living characters ever. And I wanted to like point out that it is a note, it is a radiophonic piece. So part of the piece is our dialogue on top of instrumentation and just instrumentals. So I wanted to ask you about basically why did you choose stones as the main message bearers? Mm. Well, um, so the, the fifth season, you know, it, it's like the, it comes from the title of a book that, are, that already mm -hmm. exists from N.K. Jemison. Yeah. Um, it's part of a trilogy called The Broken Earth and the fifth season is like the first, first book. And when Somerset invited me to, you know, to be part of the residency, I, I was think I was um, 
I hadn't released the album yet, but I was like in the in still in that world, and I was about to share it with the world, and I was just thinking of a way to to link the two works together because I I wasn't ready to like for something completely new, so I proposed to them to do a kind of like fan fiction from the book, so mm -hmm. like yeah, so like the book. There are stories that happen, but there are also, you know, stories where the author doesn't necessarily like dig too much mm -hmm. in other stuff. And I just decided to just like take one of the one part of a story or a character and kind of like run with it. Um, and that's where the stone eaters come from. Um, the stone eaters are a species that are very important in the book. Um, but in the book, there is not so, we don't know so much about them. And um, I just decided to kind of run with that. Um, it's kind of uh, like a spin-off. Exactly, it's a spin-off. But I think it was, oh, exactly, yeah, totally. But I, <laughs> it's also important for me that, and it's the same with the record, and it's the same with the name of the book and the references of the book is that I think that they come and they nourish the work, but it's also important for me that they can exist without you knowing about that. I don't, I don't want it to be. Uh, it still has to remain really open and accessible for people that have not read the book. Because it's not about, it's not about ha having read it or not. It's more that the book becomes like a door or a point of departure for me to tell stories. I think that, I think that we talked about this book. I haven't read it, but. I feel like even though I haven't read it yet, like I can use some of the explanation that you give me and like intrigue me a whole lot and inform me in the post in like what actually inspired you behind just the book, but what actually like attracted you in the book. I think that would be interesting to, to speak about it because it's not just like, a niche science fi science fiction book. Like there is no interest in that. It's more like that. It talks about universal thing also. And I think it's, it would be cool if you actually like speak about the bigger topic that like spoke to you in this book. Mm. Because I believe it's also about someone trying to find their daughter like sure yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, there's so many layers right but mm -hmm. i think that the first thing i'm always really attracted to is world building whether mm -hmm. it's music or in, in film or in literature anyone who comes in and delivers a whole new world that you can live in as a listener or as a viewer or whatever. And, and by world building, I don't mean only like aesthetic things, but also just like, okay, in this new world, like how do people relate? How do they make love? Do they make love? You know, what's the, yeah. you know, like all of these things to me are kind of like the reason why, I don't know, the, 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 the reason why I wake up in the morning is to be able to, to, to try to, keep imagining things, to try to keep imagining the worlds that we want that don't exist and how they would look like. So anyone who works around that is going to have my full attention. And this book is really, really insane in terms of world building, like the level of details that goes into how people look, um, how people relate, how they behave, like, you know, on top of like, the geological details of how the world functions. It's like one, so all of these things. It's like a, cos it's like a cosmogony. It's like, exactly. so that, it's, exactly. I feel like this is how, this is how I felt when I read uh, the booklet that goes with your piece. Mm. And that like, it's like you're explaining in a very poetic way, how the world that you're building is actually functioning. But mm -hmm. it's not play play. It's like you're really explaining it in a way that is poetic, but still like very real. Mm -hmm. Like this 
mm. is to actually make this and this actually make that function. And mm. if you push this, this will actually fall out. Like, I think it's really interesting. And it leads me to another question. Well, that I, can it, also, I can also keep, oh no, I can, I feel like I didn't really explain all the way, but there's, cause there's so much shit. There's so much stuff to say about no. Them. Just it's just a point because we have a whole we have we have time. Okay, so. so yeah, so I think one of the things um, that I really love in in the book is that it kind of starts with the idea that when you we as human beings talk about the end of the world, it actually is never really the end of the world. It's usually the end of us in the world. And that after the end, it starts again and again and again. And, and so I think that the fifth season is also the story of... Um, it's, the, it's the story of overcoming the end and starting over, over again, knowing that the end is going to come over and over again. It's like the perpetual ending or something. But that's what the fifth season is. Um, it's a season that at first human human beings in that world could not survive. They all died. And then with time, they were born again. And then they started to learn how to survive the fifth season, which is a harsh season, which is a season of uh, interiority where there's like ash, uh, you know, it rains ash. There's not so much light. There's not so much food. Um, and little by little, they learned how to survive the end but then they know that the fifth season is coming again and there, there is something they know that, that it's the circle yeah and that's so much more interesting to me than just the end of the world you know which usually is like there there's that, like why there's, there's, like, there's like a lack of humility i think in most of the narratives that describe the end of the world as if as if the world needs human beings to function you know and um i feel like imagine imagining that it's it's it that there, there there are cycles with or without us and that and that we are just learning how to go through them as much there's something really attractive to me in that idea and um yeah and then yeah and there's there's i could go on forever but there's also one of the most beautiful love stories um, in that book that I'm really attached to. And um, like, for example, uh, monogamy is monogamy is not a thing in, in the story, but I really love how it's like not really a subject matter. It's not like this like crazy, weird thing. They, don't, they don't expand on it. It's not like a sexy orgy act, like exactly. orgy type of shit. Like. Exactly. It's just like... <laughs> And then he has this person, and then there's this person, and then sometimes it's the three of them, and they're really in love. And then she, you know, it's like it's it's like in passing, and like that kind of like mm, new normalities. I'm also really attracted to, and there's a lot of that about gender and sexuality in the book that's done in a very subtle way that doesn't like, you know, it's not the subject, but I just I love how it's normalized how how things that we have normalized are denormalized in this book. Um, I was also really attracted to that. It sounds terrific. To be honest. I, 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 I honestly, I, I mean, I'm going to offer it to you, you know? I yeah. Think. Like it sounds terrific. Like I really, I really want to learn more about that. That's mm -hmm. interesting that you speak about learn uh, about world building, because that's a term that like is used often when speaking about your art history. Mm -hmm. And like you said, like there's sonic elements from your album in the piece, most notably the mesmerizing you at the end. I won't spoil too much about um, Antimony because I want people to listen to it. But you describe it as the music after the end of the world, just like you just said. And extension level events are super present in your research, in your recent work. Mm -hmm. And yet you give also space for world building. My question would be, where does one find the tools to nurture imagination as a radical tool? Do you want me to repeat? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can repeat because I'm also thinking about the answer. But yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, wait a second. I'm just going to um, light. light. Yeah, I'm just going to fix the light. Cause... It's getting dark and sexy behind you, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, my question is basically like I was just like summing, I was just summing, making a sum up of summarizing what we just said. Mm. By saying that extension level events mm -hmm. are like super present mm. in your recent work, mm -hmm. but also in the world today, because right. we're, we're going through a pandemic, right? Yeah. Where, where does one find the tools to nurture imagination as a radical tool? Because we live in we live in an era now where we want to dismantle everything. Like especially, I mean, on the left side of the on the left side of things, right. at least, right. people want to dismantle everything. But you're talking about we're all building. Understand? Like, yeah, I do. So, <laughs> so I and I think it's really important. And this is one of the aspects that I love the most about your work in general. Like, not just and not just antimony, but like this new era that you're in, I feel like Ancestor Boy was more like maybe focused on like lineage and like finding yourself, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, this era is more about like finding yourself, but finding the world that you want to live in. Mm -hmm. Like, and my question is like, how in the world that you live in, you can, how can you nurture your imagination as a radical tool? Like, how do you, how do you manage to like nurture your imagination as an artist? Mm. To be honest, I think that's, I think that's literally the reason why I make music or it's, it's the reason why I make art, whatever it is. I think that my, you know, you have, you can feel that there is different destinies in, 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 in like, I feel like I've always felt, it's not new, I've always felt that mine is to, like the, the importance of imagination. I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's been really hard for me growing up also in, in, in the era that I've been growing up to find that I was surrounded by people who were having an easiest time imagining the end of the world than imagining the world that what they wanted to live in. And I think that that's kind of, that didn't used to be the case necessarily, um, you know, in previous times and maybe, you know, maybe it's cyclical. So I'm sure there was on and off times, but I think that I have been pretty, I've been feeling really suffocating for a really long time about the lack of, uh, of, of expressing what it is that we want. And I've had, I've, and I've, and I've, and I felt, oh, you know, I felt that from the left, very strongly. You know, if you if you observe the left, you know, I'm not talking about like more niche stuff, but I'm talking about like general conversations. The general yeah. conversations are always the things that we're against. Yeah, and I it. I, f I feel really scared. I think that's like the most scary thing for me is to stop to stop formulating what we want. So I don't know, I can't really, I don't know where it is that I find that, but I know that it's something I nurture. It's something that I talk about. It's something that I, the conversations I have daily with myself, with my, the people I love, with my friends, as you know, it's like, mm, I'm, I'm, I feel like people are like, what's your skincare routine all the time? But people don't be like, what's your imagination routine? I, <laughs> be, <laughs> I just want people I think, to- No, no, you're right. I don't know if there's, I think the imagination routine for me is to go, I, I think the, the way that I've, that I find the inspiration is through being really interested in people who have imagined in the past and who are imagining right now and they're usually like re they're like hidden histories whether it's now or before there are things that you have to look for a little more because again the things that are at the forefront are usually more like 
uh, dystopia. We, we have so much room for that. Uh, it, it's so loud. It's so, so loud to imagine the, the end that the, the histories of things that have happened in the past and the people who are imagining right now are way more quiet. And so I think maybe my practice is to go find those stories because that's where I find my, that's where I like, that's, you know, I, like, for example, um, I was watching um, um, organize, the Organized Noise documentary that I sent to you the other day. Yeah, I love Organized Noise. That's yeah. a cool name. Also. Yeah, it's an amazing name, but it, and so like that. So I'm like watching this, and like in in that story, you know, everyone's like, I mean, we can we can talk about how like sonically. Just just to, just to I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just oh. to like just to specify who is organized noise because we oh. be nerds, but not everyone be nerds, Loki. Oh. <laughs> um. You go. You know better than me. Oh, I know. But to, just to summarize, like it, it's a group, sort of like a collective. Uh, with, um, um, Goody Mob, Outcast, um, the uh, on, like the uncle of Future. Like I forgot his name. Like his name is Rico, I think. Yeah, record. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot the the last name, but oh, it's yeah. Mm. It's like a it's like a crew of like producers and rappers that used to like basically like just like lock themselves up in their basement in Atlanta and like they came up with a sound for the city that didn't exist before because Atlanta sound was very much like. Miami based sound, but they didn't have an identity. Like, and their identity didn't sound like the identity of New York or the West Coast or anything that actually came out before. Mm. So, but it comes from the isolation and it comes from like looking within yourself and sticking with your folks and looking at each other like for real. And so, yeah. Basically, like this is the reason why um, Outcast is so awesome to this till this day and so timeless music yeah. is because they built something on their own and went with with this. So yeah, this is organized noise. This is organized noise, and there's something so utopian, you know, in that mm -hmm. experience. True. So selfless. Mm -hmm. No one was interested in their own careers. It wasn't about me. It was about us. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone knew what they were like, what kind of skills they had honed. You know, like not everyone had to be good at everything. You had like he was really good at like with the words. He was really good with the baseline. Like it, it was, it, and and like the and and it created like such an incredible ex experience of life. And then that that got poured into music and. I, I mean, that's just like one example of, of this is where I find my inspiration. That's the world I want to live in. I feel really dissatisfied, and you know that. I'm mm -hmm. really dissatisfied by the how individualistic our careers are. I, I don't find pleasure and I don't find happiness in, you know, my career. Is it like, it's like, like, I, they, I like this super, like, this model of like I did everything myself, bedroom producer, exactly. superstar. Like I'm alone in the studio exactly. and I'm grooving by myself. Like it's it can be cool at times to come up with something by yourself. Like I, mean, I do all the time, but that doesn't mean that my goal is to be. You know, that's not a goal. It's it, of course it happens, yeah. and I need and I also need solitude in my practice. But I'm just saying like the 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 kind of like trajectories or lineage of being like a solo artist i don't i don't first of all i, I think it's usually a lie because there's so many people involved in a career but i also don't find any joy in that and you know that's like one little thing where i'm like that the world i want to live in like and and like organized those documentary is like it's the story that has happened so that's like a pretty recent story but that's the kind of places where i go and i'm like that's a that's a recent story, but I feel like it's a story that gets overlooked because it's exactly. easier. 
it's easier to it's easier to just pick seed exactly. or green exactly. or in the 2000 and be like they're great vocalists they're great yeah. rap they're like one of the best rapper that ever lived instead of actually looking at the structure that was behind them exactly. you know like exactly. so i think that it's not a, like outcast is like a multi-platinum diamond selling you know like i think that not a lot of people actually um know about their process of making music and stuff so i think it's 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 greatly overlooked and it's great to shed light on that to be honest yeah i agree and yeah i just i i feel like usually ex experience like social experiences whether they give birth to a, you know a sound or, or or like a new economy or new they're usually overshadowed you know like lately i'm also like reading a lot about like Black anarchism, and I have for like the past couple of years. It's not a new fashionable thing, but suddenly you're like, okay, you you know, we've known about the Black Panthers. There's a reason why we've known about them because there there is something that's like sellable in that. But there's so much history that's been overlooked of people who have went way harder. I mean, no, obviously, yeah. You know, okay. I when you ask me about my routine, my routine is about finding the overlooked the overlooked histories of now and then and and find inspirations in people who've, who've imagined before us, you know? Like, that's, that's my the routine. The unknown heroes. Yeah. Yes, that's my routine. That's really cool. It's a research routine. That's really cool. I really like that. And I think that it's a healthy practice because we live also in a world where, like, algorithm makes you look at the same thing over and over again and you don't really realize it and you don't really realize why you're depressed but honey you're depressed because you look at things that you you don't really want to look at it's always the same program and this deprogramming is not easy if you're not aware of it in the first place so yep i think that this is really interesting. I'm just looking for my next que my next question. So basically you mentioned Mark Fisher as one of your influences behind the piece. Mm -hmm. Um is we're gonna talk afterwards, like you you can I'm gonna ask you a question on Van Vanishing Land, but before getting into Vanishing Land, like I would like you to expand on a quote that we actually know both of us but that we can expand on he mark fisher that is like a philosopher a critical terrorist and um a colonist and yeah just philosopher mm -hmm. um he has written extensively about what we call now like late capitalism and accelerationism, as well as like ontology, de like depression, mm -hmm. and also like grief a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's not just like a, a like um a terrorist that just speak about capitalism. He also speaks about a lot of stuff that are actually like I feel like a little bit occult. So um, I think that it needs, it needs to be said, but one of the quotes that I wanted to expand on, it's, it's, it's easier to imagine the end of the world and the end of capitalism. Because we keep speaking about the end of the world, why do you feel like, how do you, how, what does this, this quote evokes, evoke in you? Mm. I use it all the time, and you know that. <laughs> yeah, but I literally use it as I, I literally feel like I'm quoting myself when I say that. But I, I know it's smart. But <laughs> no, it's you sound like a smart ass when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> I think that I, I, I just, I, yeah. To, to me, like, the, hmm, what does it evoke? It's like the it's like death. That's what it evokes. That's death to me. That's like this. This that that is what the scariest thing is. Is this is exactly that? Are you asking me why it's happening or? 
No, not why, <laughs> but, but, just, but just like death is a strong word. Like, you need no, to but I, but I think it is. I think it is. I, I really think that to, to stop imagining what it is that you want in the world is death. Mm. The, to, to stop imagining is, is, is death. I mean, then you become a, a bot, you know. No, this to bots though. Bots are, you know, maybe. <laughs> no, it's true. I, 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 no, I, this to bots. I'm just, I'm just ready. No, I'm just saying because because I've been like thinking about you know, I've been thinking about like other species' point of views lately a lot because there's a lot of that in the book. There's a lot of that in my piece, um, and and my partner also always talks about that in terms of like computers and robots. And I don't know, maybe we have created, maybe we have created a species that is, has emotions and stuff and that we're, we're being really um, destructive with them. So I, 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 that's why I said what? no, no this to bots because it's not, it's not cause it's not human that it's less or that it doesn't feel. Um, it's actually fucking length level. We're talking about butts feeling. I don't but know. I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I actually feel you. I feel like it's, it's been, it's been a common thing. And every time I share this quote with people, they're usually like mind blown and like galaxy brain because it's the key yes. that it needs to be unlocked most of yes. the time. It's like, it will take time in one's practice or in one's world to actually reach, to not reach because it feels condescending, but to actually like just enter this, this um, zone, I would say, which is, like imagining what's good for you, but it can be really small. Like it can be really small. Like it doesn't have to be like a whole economical system. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I feel like, but I feel like, unfortunately, when this quotes also comes in, that's what a lot of people think about. They think they have to imagine like a whole system right away, which is. Yeah like it's being really hard on yourself because well it's also like the wrong order you know mm -hmm. because the, the bigger thing i think we've been also thought about we've been taught about this like bigger uh, scale thing but i think it's also fraud like the bigger system comes from like the type the, the 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 ground floor it's like how does you know capitalism wouldn't be existing if men weren't dominating women, you know what I mean? It doesn't start all the way there. It starts in the relationships and how you implement new morals. Um, if you live in a world where, I don't know, um, kindness is more valued than yeah. greed, then that gives birth to another system. But it comes from like the small ways that we have to relate to each other, to... I like it, but I think that I can see it in the piece because you also stress out the importance of like nature and like it can be nature in a macroscopic scale, but also like in a microscopic scale. Mm. And I think that's really important. Like, what's your relationship with nature? Like, do you use field recordings? Stuff like mm. that. Yeah, I do. Um, I usually use other people's field recordings because they're usually better than mine. But um, but a lot yeah, of, it's the whole job. Yeah, it's it's this somebody's job for sure. But I think it's like also a matter of like scale. Um, it's when I think about nature, I also don't, you know, I've I've had a pretty, I'd say, regular relationship to psychedelics for for a few years now, and one of the things that I feel like everybody who's has or is having any kind of relationship with psychedelics understands from those experiences is that we kind of like created this separation between us and like objects, you know, there's like us and the animals and there's us and the telephone and there's, 
and that's 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 fraud that's fraud so the the things that on like it's when i think about nature i don't necessarily think of like big things i was to think about the like the the things that our eyes don't see the things that we don't mm-hmm. you know, the things that live you know next to us among us that we don't really have necessarily a relationship with because we just decided that they were less because they're like smaller or we think they're not smart or that our whole experience is just from our own point of view and that there's other points of views. I know it sounds really simple, but it's like something I've been kind of trying No, it doesn't sound simple at all. I understand because now also have my own relationship to Psyche B. Yeah. But like, it's like, <laughs> it's like, I don't think it's that simple. I think that you can understand the words that are being said, but to, ins- to understand the experience experience mm, exactly. different things because going to a forest is definitely much needed in this time and like experiences like going outside and just like being in nature and being like in the scent like outside of the city is always like a good thing to like resource yourself and like situate yourself a little bit but it's true that like we rather have like a, a relationship with a tree that is already grown mm. than with like a microscopic like little insect that is actually annoying low key. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah this idea that this idea that it's like us and then there's like nature that's also really you know and that's what the what the piece is about also is that I started yet yeah, being interested in like different um, mythologies of, around, you know, the first human, I guess. And um, there's a lot of people saying like, um, there's a lot of different cultures actually that are, that, are, that are saying the same thing, that we actually come from stone, that the first, li- that the first living- Or not, minerals. Yeah, that we, that we come from clay, that we come from stone. So this kind of, idea that we normalize by being like our relationship to nature as if it's like something external of us um when we are we actually feel like human all, beings we're basically all stone eaters it's we, true we, we basically we, be, we we say like we say in in french we say être humain et être vivant oui Exactly. But also, like, être vivant et être inanimé, etc. There's a lot of, like, categories and stuff. We have questions, actually. Okay. So, um, so um, someone asked, would you say Antimony is more theatrical than your album? And if so, how? How did working in specialized sound influence that? Hmm. Um, yeah, it's definitely more theatrical. I thought about it as a, I thought about it as a little like Greek tragedy or something, um, with like a, the Greek choir that comes and says the truth about the story, and then the narrator who has a relationship with the main character, and then the voice of the main character is like different. Um, There's a lot of elements that. Yeah, so definitely more theatrical. Um, just like I feel like um, I don't know. I actually, I mean, in my in my records, I always I'm always really interested also in the explosion of uh, the the narrator. It's never like it's never like me me. Sometimes me is someone else. Sometimes me is a lot of people. Sometimes so I've always been interested in this. But I think in this piece, I made it like more formally closer to to like the like theater choir opera thing. Um, how did working in spatialized sound influence that? I mean that you know it. You 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 you. Hmm. There is there are images that you're able to convey in much in such a different at, a, at a, such a different level when you have spatialized sound because I was able to say, for example. Okay, so when the listener is here, 
you know, this is the feeling of this character. Are they, are they, are they in front of the listener? Or are they in the back? Are they coming? So it's, it's kind of like a mix between a movie and a sonic piece. I feel like that's what spatialized sound does is that you're able to create like, yeah, and a real imagery of the sound. Um, and that was very satisfying to be able to think about um, where it comes from and why it comes from there. Mm. It looks, it special sound like, it sounds very luxurious. I mean, it is, it's like a 36, um, I think it's like 36 speakers or something. So there's a lot, a lot of intention, I guess, that could go in. Who is the narrator? The narrator is someone who has a relationship with um, antimony. She has a, she has a, she has an intimate relationship with the main character of the story, and that's why. And so she's telling the story of the main character through the relationship. Sure, yeah. yeah, through her lens, because she knows the character that she's describing very well. Yeah. So, I yeah, I wanted, I, I mean, it was quite obvious to me that it would be like that. There's there's something more intimate. I I, I don't know. I feel like uh, you're 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 telling you know you're telling a story that sounds like some kind of like new mythology around the first human beings and the beginning of the world and stuff like that and and it sounds really like the scale of it is like you know once upon a time but it was, <laughs> you know but and but it was really important for me to to also bring that to something very intimate and not be like this like external narrator that knows everything about everyone, you know, that doesn't have to Yeah, yeah I like the mix of uh, making- The mix of like, and like something more intimate maybe than like just some uh, narrator, uh, a narrator that is like, like, how do you say in French? Like- A narrator omniscient. Omniscient, voila. So uh, it's like- it feels it feels like God sometimes, and it's exactly. like it's not a good feeling sometimes. Exactly. No this to God, but uh, no this to robots. No this to God. <laughs> is, <laughs> the next question would be like, what? It's from me. It's like, what was the process of like writing the piece? Like, did you lay down the music first, mm. or did you write first? Like, what was the process of it? Mm, no, the process. The process was just first finding out what the story was about, um, the storytelling, because I I really wanted the piece to be centered about the story more than the music. I wanted the music to serve the story. Yeah. Um, then I invited um, Trustfall to. I just like pitched him my story, kind of. Um, so started writing a little bit to set up the tone and then I let him write because he's an amazing writer. Um, shout out to Trustfall. Shout out to Trustfall for sure. Um, and yeah, I don't write stories like that. So it was very important for me to collaborate with him on that. And then after, I, I, yeah, I feel like once I had the music, I was like, I started like, I knew that I wanted music from the 50s for my record to be in there. I knew that I needed to tell other stories on top of these instrumentations. And then, yeah, the music came to serve the story. That was the order. And where did you actually, like, was it like this fashion, different locations, or did you stay somewhere to actually uh, do well, everything? This this was a very chaotic summer, which I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was not, not really. I'm so re relieved that we're out of this. Um, I mean, it's pretty chaotic right now. This Mars retrograde thing is making some um, weird shifts. Anyway, it's been it's it's been it's been all over the place. So no, I I was kind of in different places working on this. At the same time, I feel like every I feel like the the album and the piece is 
just arrived right on time, in my opinion. So, I I like, it's, it's really what a lot of people needed. And, yeah, I'm going to draw the talk to a close. Okay. And we're going to wrap it up because okay. it's just time okay. to, to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And the piece is going to be presented at 7 p.m. London time. So it means 8 p.m. for the Parisians. Mm -hmm. following, your, following this chat, and you will have to go on assembly2020.co to actually hear the piece. I advise you to wear headphones because yeah. you would be able to experience the stereo, the stereo work and like the, the binaural um, 360 sound system and one one thing i would like to say is please watch um all the credits of the piece so you can learn about all my collaborators there's different voices in there there's different musics from different people like it's a collaborative piece as I exactly we, we didn't actually get into that we didn't manage to get into the collaborative essence of this piece but I want to say the collaborative essence of your overall work. Right. Just don't sit here and listen to music and think that it's just one person. Just get into the process. Right. Learn how who who did what, who did right. the drums and the synth and the mixing and the writing and the you write most of your work, and I know that you compose most of your work. You came up with a lot of ideas, but I also know that you love bringing new people in your process and into your adventure. So we're both stressing on the on the importance of actually giving people their flowers while they're here and not waiting. So yeah. <laughs> so go to assembly2020.co and it was a pleasure to speak to you. Um, and I really, I uh, really enjoyed the piece. I'm going to still listen to it now. Thank you. Bye-bye.